Thank you all for being here. It's a, it's a distinct pleasure and an honor uh, to um, spend our last monthly dialogue with you in this kind of a capacity. So thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm, I'm truly honored uh, that you're all here. Um, let me uh, start out uh, by telling you a couple of things about why I wrote this book. Uh, I think the title is pretty self-explanatory, The Impossibility of Palestine. A colleague of mine uh, heard uh, I had written this book, and it had just come out, and said, well, what's the thesis? And I said, um, the thesis is on the cover, uh, The Impossibility of Palestine. What's important is the reasons uh, why I think... Um, this title is warranted. And uh, so what I hope to do for the next uh, half hour or so is to give you a snippet of why I think uh, this title is an appropriate uh, title. But before I do, let me just tell you why I felt the need uh, to write this book and why the, um, uh, why the uh, admittedly provocative title. Uh, I started thinking about Palestine um, uh, when I first started teaching uh, as a uh, political science professor back in uh, 1991. And uh, I started uh, thinking about uh, the future of Palestine, as did so many uh, other people before and after and during the time that I, was, uh, that I had started doing this. And I first went to Palestine in um, uh, 1993. I figured I couldn't uh, figure it out. So I first, the first time I went there, uh, for me, relatively, was actually quite late. Uh, I didn't go there. I should have gone there a lot earlier. But it wasn't until 91, uh, 93 that I had a chance to uh, finally go there and see the place and travel upside, travel throughout um, both Israel proper and Palestine, and go to different uh, uh, towns and cities and spend time there. And I was immediately struck uh, while I was on the ground by the inconsistency between my own assumptions and what I had studied and what I had thought about over the years and the reality on the ground. I was immediately uh, shocked, quite frankly, by what I saw and what I experienced on the ground and that understanding that, and by 93, I'd been a professor of political science for two years, I actually thought I knew what I was talking about and I realized that I didn't really know. And, and I started thinking about um, the realities on the ground, the situation on the ground, I started thinking about Palestinian political entity as a state. I started thinking about Palestinian politics uh, uh, as uh, articulated in the Oslo Accords. This was a very exciting time in the 90s when for the first time Israelis and Palestinians uh, shook hands on the lawn of the White House and uh, decided to um, sign a peace treaty. And I realized that there was tremendous inconsistencies between my assumptions and, and these realities, and that the Oslo Accords, which so excited people like me, didn't really jive with reality, but I went along with it. And in uh, 2005, I wrote uh, a book which uh, Dean Nonneman so kindly uh, mentioned uh, called The Modern Middle East. And uh, in there, I toyed around with the idea, intellectually, uh, the idea of Palestine, the reality of Palestine, and Palestine's future. And uh, one of the ideas I talked about there, was, which I kind of alluded to in the book, but didn't quite have the intellectual know-how and the intellectual instruments to really engage with was uh, the Palestinian Authority and more specifically the future of the Palestinian Authority as I thought uh, uh, would, uh, would, would pan out. 
In the meanwhile, I had gone to Palestine a couple of times again. I had uh, gone to Israel again. And uh, the book, uh, The Modern Middle East, was uh, published again. Uh, a second edition came out in 2011 uh, in the aftermath of the Arab uprisings. And I made some slight modifications to the thesis uh, there. and. Um, as you know, the Arab Spring uh, had consequences that we're still experiencing that none of us expected and anticipated. And so by 2013, when um, I published the third edition of that book, I still had the same um, uh, conclusions, but I was not happy with them. I knew that in some ways I was not being honest with myself, that I really needed to have the intellectual courage to really delve into this issue of, um, of Palestine and, and what is the road ahead? What's the reality on the ground? And more specifically, I needed to understand for myself better Palestinian history and Palestinian politics as it has unfolded and as it will inform Palestine's future. So after 2013 and with a couple of other intellectual detours, I decided to delve into this topic and, uh, and, and I spent some time in Ramallah and Bethlehem and, and, uh, and Jerusalem, both East and West Jerusalem, I didn't go to Gaza, couldn't go to Gaza, but I, I decided uh, that, uh, that I needed to write this. And let me tell you what the thesis of the book is, and then hopefully by the end of the talk, you would have seen some of the questions that I had to grapple with to come out with that conclusion. As I studied this topic, and as I delved into it, I came to the sad conclusion, and I say this in the book, you know, social scientists are trained to be cold and objective and not, their, not let their emotions uh, come in, uh, in the way of their conclusions. But I do say in the preface and in a couple of places that I am not happy with the conclusions of the book. But nevertheless, uh, reality hurts. I say that if you think about Palestinian history and Palestinian society and Palestinian politics. A Palestinian state is impossible. That the realities on the ground, as they have unfolded, have made a Palestinian state impossible and improbable. It ain't going to happen. But a Palestinian nation, or more specifically, a Palestinian national identity, will continue to live on and will be extremely vibrant. In fact, the vibrance of Palestinian identity, of what it is to be Palestinian, lies largely because of the impossibility of the Palestinian state. The very fact that Palestinians don't have an identity makes them very proud to be Palestinian and wear their identity, so to say, on their sleeve. Now, let me say what I mean. Why do I say Palestine is impossible? And why is it? Now, by itself to say Palestine is untenable or impossible isn't original. Uh, but I hope that in my analysis, there's been some uh, originality there. There are three reasons that have made a Palestinian state impossible. These are extremely complicated and require an entire book or two. But let me uh, tease out some of these reasons. First and foremost, a Palestinian state is impossible because of the political forces that have shaped Palestinian history. A number of political forces over time have shaped Palestinian history, and a number of political forces continue to shape Palestinian history that have made Palestine 
an impossibility. There are four broad sets of political reasons, political dynamics that are responsible. Four broad subsets of political reasons. First of all, we forget that in 1948, 1947 and 1948, there was conquest and defeat. There was conquest and utter defeat of Palestine. And the defeat of Palestine in 1948, 1947-1948, was not just a military phenomenon. It was a phenomenon, it was a military conquest that had a host of other repercussions and ramifications, a lot of which continue to live on today. This was a conquest of a technologically, industrially superior nation of a technologically, industrially, relatively underdeveloped nation. And Israeli national identity came and conquered, defeated militarily and physically, territorially conquered a Palestinian entity, a Palestinian community that was ill-equipped to deal with that other uh, civilization. You have a clash of civilizations which, and, and, and the civilization that was better equipped and had more zeal, had, had more articulate uh, leadership, had much more determined uh, leadership, that civilization won and the other one lost. So that was one reason. But the civilization or the nation that won did a second thing. And it continues to do the second thing. What I'm about to tell you might be a little unpalatable or hard to stomach, but thanks to Israeli scholars since the uh, 90s, this is a term that is oftentimes used. And my analysis has actually been based on the insights offered by Israeli scholars. The second political reason why Palestine is untenable and impossible is because of ethnic cleansing. No doubt about it. There were two episodes of ethnic cleansing. First one in 1947-1948, second one in 1967. And that ethnic cleansing has developed into, has morphed into a different phenomenon today, which might be called silent transfer. Silent transfer. Whereby the Palestinian presence in historic Palestine is being slowly, gradually, but steadily eroded, reduced by various administrative means by various legal regulations. For example, there is something in uh, uh, the West Bank called center of life policy, whereby if you want to live in East Jerusalem, you have to show proof that for the last five years, you've lived in West Jerusalem. And so, uh, in, sorry, in East Jerusalem. And so you've got to show um, a, a water bill, uh, you've got to show a phone bill, you've got to show school records, you have to show continuous residence. And if you want to get married, let's say you're a young Palestinian 20-something-year-old uh, woman and you want to marry a, a Palestinian uh, guy, both of you have to show proof of life, uh, center of life policy. Otherwise, you have to leave uh, what Israel considers. This is nothing other than silent transfer, a transfer of Palestinians steadily and slowly out of historic Palestine. And, and again, this whole notion of ethnic cleansing, which is hard to stomach, difficult to stomach, has been widely discussed by a whole host of Israeli scholars on both sides of the spectrum. There's something in Israel called new historians. It's not just the new historians who talk about it. It's other regular Israeli historians uh, that have wa written widely. Uh, Israel uh, has a rule whereby every 50 years, archival material gets released. And 50 years after 1948, so in the late 90s, 
uh, a lot of our uh, uh, original archival material was released, and you look at those, and it's hard to say by any definition this is ethnic cleansing. So, so far I've given you two reasons for the political improbability or impossibility of Palestine, the consequences of uh, conquest and defeat, and secondly, ethnic cleansing uh, in 1948 and 67, and the silent transfer that has been continuing. A third reason is because of the defeat of armed struggle that Palestinians took up in the 1970s. In the 1970s, in the aftermath of the 1967 defeat, Palestinians took matters into their own hands and took up arms against Israel. And uh, the, throughout the 1970s, you had the decade of armed struggle. And while armed struggle was fantastic in uh, giving Israel, for, from a Palestinian perspective, it gave Israel a bloody nose, it gave Palestinians a, self, a sense of self-assertion. It gave them a sense of identity and big being and belonging. Ultimately, it defeated the Palestinian cause. Or it was a self-defeating endeavor. It didn't get anywhere. It didn't get anywhere. Ultimately, it discredited a uh, Palestinian uh, cause before Europeans. It had the opposite intent of what it was intended to do, and it didn't work. And the fourth reason uh, is the betrayal of Palestinian leadership. The betrayal of Palestinian leadership. Oslo Accord was signed in uh, 1993 to tremendous historic fanfare. Palestinians loved it, a new era. Palestinian, the leader, the uh, bearer of the Palestinian mantle, Yasser Arafat, became a rais, became the Palestinian president. And in his presidential headquarters, he had a presidential honor guard. And there was a Palestinian flag and a Palestinian, the red carpet was... Uh, 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 extended for visiting dignitaries, and a sense of Palestinian statehood started to occur. And before long, within a couple of years, Palestinians realized that the leadership, and it was called the leadership, was not so interested in Palestinian statehood as it was more interested in maintaining the status quo. It was more interested in maintaining a status quo that in a year after the signing of the Oslo Accord developed an economic aspect. We all know about the Oslo Accord of 1993. What we don't talk about or what many people don't know is the Paris Economic Protocol of 1994, which made the shekel, the Israeli currency, the common currency used in Palestinian territories, which made the Israeli government the primary collector of tariffs going in and out of Palestinian territory, which made Israel the sole trading partner of Israeli goods going in and out. Study the PEP, the Paris Economic Protocol. And beginning a year after the signing of the Oslo Accord, things were going downhill. But in the enthusiasm of the moment, in the excitement of the historic signing of the Oslo Accord, me and many others, including millions of Palestinians in Palestine and around the world, refused to see or couldn't see the consequences of what was happening. Probably Palestinian leaders themselves couldn't see the consequences of the treaties they were signing. And the way that Palestine was being divided into ungovernable, ungovernable entities. So the first reason, these four reasons that I gave you, the politics of conquest and defeat, ethnic cleansing and silent transfer, the defeat of the armed struggle, and the betrayal of Palestinian leadership, those were one set of reasons why Palestine itself is, is impossible. A second reason is geography. A second reason is geography. 
And while I mentioned the Oslo Accords, let's spend a little bit of time studying the Oslo Accords in greater detail. The Oslo Accords had a simple premise of Gaza first. All right, Gaza goes to the Palestinians, although Gaza didn't go to the Palestinians until much later. And the Gaza Accord divided the West Bank into three chunks, or three areas. Area A, which was under Palestinian control. Area B, which was under Israeli military control and Palestinian civil control, administrative control, and Area C, which was all Israeli. Now, this is a great map because it shows you which map is, uh, which area is under whose control. Area A is the yellow that you see. Area B, which is under joint control. Area B was supposed to be for purposes of confidence building. Israel will control Area B militarily, and Palestinian Authority would control it administratively. Area B is, uh, you, you see it in um, uh, light brown. And Area C is white, which is uh, off limits to Palestinians. This is the Palestine that, when I talk about betrayal of Palestinian leadership, this is the result of the Oslo Accord. This is the Palestine that the Palestinian leadership agreed to. Now, you can, uh, in their defense, probably you can say, well, they didn't know what they were signing, or they didn't do this deliberately, but, but this is ultimately uh, the, the outcome. Uh, to see this differently, uh, to look at this slightly differently, I'll just show you a couple of slides uh, uh, that would give you a sense of the geography and a visual sense of exactly uh, what it is uh, we're talking about. This shows the same thing. Again, this is a map of the uh, Oslo Accord, according to the Oslo Accord. Here, the dark side is Israeli territory, off limits to Palestinians. This, by the way, is the West Bank. This is not Israel. This is the West Bank that we talk about. You go to the West Bank, and so imagine if you are in Hebron, and you want to go visit your cousins in uh, Nablus. You cannot take the bus from Hebron and go straight. So previously, it would take you about an hour by bus. So uh, the West Bank is about half the size of Qatar, visually. Just if you can kind of visually, it's, we're talking about half the size of Qatar, just approximately. So now you can't go because you're going through Israeli-controlled territories. You've got to pass through checkpoints. In a minute, I'll show you a map of checkpoints. So what we have here is a Swiss cheese, Swiss cheese state. Swiss cheese state. No other way to, uh, to describe it. Now, you got to go through Israeli military checkpoints. This is a map of the United Nations. This is a UN map that looks at uh, uh, free, uh, restrictions on Palestinian mobility. And again, what you see is if you're going from here, let's say up north, there are roads that you cannot bypass. So what the Israelis have done is all of the uh, border areas are um, uh, all of the border areas are off uh, off limits to Palestinians, but then there are some uh, big Palestinian uh, uh, areas, Palestinian er uh, cities, communities that the Israelis uh, are not present. One is right down south; the other is right kind of in the geographic center of, uh, of uh, Ramallah. Now, you got to go through uh, 
in what you don't see here are these checkpoints. All these little dots are Israeli checkpoints that you got to go through. When you go from, uh, as, as you're trying to pass through Palestine, mobility through Palestine. Just to give you a geographic sense of where the checkpoints are, these are the checkpoints. These are some of the main roads, and these are the checkpoints. Checkpoints. Now, on this map, what you see is this red line. And this is the uh, wall, the security barrier that Israel uh, has built. You might remember initially this was called the security fence. Well, it's actually a wall, and what has happened with the fence, you see these are, this is the green line that was agreed in 1967. 10% of the West Bank falls outside of the line, outside of the wall. So the wall is being built in a way that 10% of the West Bank is uh, falling outside. Right here, you see? This is the green line, but it doesn't mean anything. And, and what you see, just keep this in mind. Right here, it goes through some, uh, and it, it, has, it hasn't been completed yet. So keep that, uh, that geographic thing in mind. Uh, this is the wall. It's not a security fence. It's, a, it's an absolute, it's a wall uh, approximately 12 feet long. And there are uh, bypass roads right on the other side. This is on the Palestinian side. Uh, there are bypass roads uh, that um, uh, are for secur uh, Israeli security forces. And this wall snakes through uh, historic Palestine uh, and, uh, and Israel. And it just uh, snakes. And a lot of times it divides villages. It goes right through villages. Now, this happened, this is, uh, you, if you look at it, the only way, those of you who've been to the West Bank, uh, the only way that at least I could tell if a house is Israeli or Palestinian was by the color of the water tank. Uh, Palestinian houses on rooftops have black water tanks. So if you look, you see a lot of black water tanks. You can just barely make them. This is Palestine, West Bank. That's Israel. They're both Arab villages. They're both uh, Arab. Uh, and, and it goes right through. Now, there are some areas where the wall overlaps. It doesn't necessarily meet, and it overlaps like this. And that area is called the seam zone. And there are actually entire communities, entire families, homes, that live in this seam zone. When the wall has come and hasn't quite met, and it kind of goes like this, and there are entire homes within, within the seam zone. So a second reason uh, that it doesn't, that Palestine is untenable is because of geography. This Swiss cheese state, kind of these holes that I showed you. The question I think that we need to ask is, are we looking at Palestine as a country or at Palestine as a series of cities? Are we looking at Nablus and Hebron and Ramallah that are cut off from each other? And where communication between them is, uh, is uh, improbable. I remember I was in, um, as I was doing research, uh, one of the uh, Palestinian interlocutors that I spoke with, I said, well, how do you maintain contact with the guy in the other city? He said, well, you know, there's Skype. Well, you know, Skype does not a country make. Skype does not a country make. So geography is a second reason. But probably the most important and consequential reason why Palestine 
is impossible, is changes to Palestinian society itself. Three reasons. Politics, geography, and the social change that Palestine has experienced after the catastrophic defeat of 1947-48. In addition to ethnic cleansing, in addition to the silent transfer that I talked about earlier, there are multiple divisions within Palestinian society. It isn't just Palestine in the north of West Bank and south of West Bank. It's Palestine in the West Bank and Gaza. It's Palestine in the West Bank and Gaza and in the diaspora. Palestinians who have never seen Palestine. Palestinians who, have, uh, who are in other Arab countries and Palestinians who are in uh, European countries or in North Africa. The multiple divisions. But the one curse that has been far more consequential than all these divisions is the curse of civil society. Now, when the Oslo Accord was signed, a lot of Europeans, in their eagerness to help Palestine rebuild, and a lot of Palestinians, in their eagerness to go and help their country develop, went back and started civil society organizations, professional associations. They started these associations that were designed to help draw maps. They started associations that non-governmental organizations that would support uh, uh, infants who had lost their parents in the intifada. They started uh, associations that would help the handicap. And in the early 1990s, these associations did magical work. They helped Palestinian society get on its feet, and they addressed those areas of Palestinian society that would otherwise never get addressed. And then they needed funding, so they wrote proposals. And they wrote proposals to the World Bank and the United Nations and American funding agencies and European funding agencies. And before long, these organizations, non-governmental organizations, started chasing funders. And by the time you came to the, after 2001, September 11, you had to show that you were not funding terrorist organizations. You had to show, impress your funders, that what you were after was stability and status quo. What you had to show that you were an organization that was meant to present a positive image of Palestine. So you couldn't necessarily go and fund uh, people with political objectives. And there was a proliferation of civil society organizations, all for good reasons, with incredibly unintended consequences. Palestinian society has today, in the West Bank and to a lesser extent in Gaza, has become paralyzed because of the work of these civil society organizations. Because civil society organizations then developed a dynamic of their own. They had funding from Europe. They needed people who could write funding proposals. So any young Palestinian uh, or any Palestinian who could speak English or who knew the jargon of the funders started writing uh, funding proposals. And they had cushy offices, air-conditioned offices in Ramallah and Bethlehem. And they had conferences in nice hotels. And these civil society organizations started chasing funders and forgot what it is that brought them there in the first place. And an audit by European uh, associations showed that 80% of these guys had boards that were only on paper. 80%, 85% had directors who'd been directors for life. And there was no process of who gets what funding and for what purpose. And, and you, I said this, uh, Excellency, in Berlin, and people were upset with me. 
Because I said, you guys talk about Europeans, you talk about funding social, civil society organizations. The civil society organizations have sapped the potential of Palestinian society. They are now dependent. They've become reliant and dependent on these, these funders. So, let me, now that I've depressed myself and all of you, <laughs> road ahead. That's the predicament we're in now. What's the road ahead? And I think oftentimes when we think of the road ahead, we forget the lessons of history. Those who do not their, know their history are condemned to repeat it. So let me remind you of some historical scenarios. Let me just remind you, you're all familiar with it. If you look at history, you see three patterns emerging. One pattern, you see countries that ceased to exist. Poland. For 75 years, there was no Poland. And it re-emerged stronger and more powerful and more vibrant than before. And it re-emerged the whole time it wasn't there. It had international support. And uh, so it, and it had a vibrant society and it had an industrial base and it had uh, none of the social maladies that we see. Uh, in some societies, including in Palestinian society. So one example is Poland or uh, Confederate of Common, uh, Commonwealth of uh, 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 Confederate States. Uh, what is it? Uh, the Azerbaijan and Armenia and all these states that were reborn. So one historic scenario, one historic example are countries that died but had a rebirth, experienced the rebirth of one form or another. Then you have the opposite extreme. Think of Tibet, where in Tibet now, there are more Han Chinese than Tibetans. We talk about Tibet, there's a Dalai Lama, uh, Hollywood actors love to talk about Tibet, and some of them go and wear, uh, they, they kind of, uh, are all eager to embrace uh, the suffering of Tibetans and all that. But there's no Tibet. There's, you think of Tibet. It, it's, you know, it, doesn't have, uh, it doesn't have tangible presence. And that's the opposite extreme. There's a third scenario in between. And it's with that note that I want to end uh, this discussion. And I wish I had a different ending. You all remember what happened to the Aborigines in Australia. Conquest, defeat, and Australia. You remember what happened to the Aborigines in uh, New Zealand. Conquest, defeat, and we have the Maori of today. We have Maori society. Or better yet, you remember, you know full well, even better, what happened to the uh, Native Americans in the United States. And now, today, you go to reservations. They have their reservations. Some reservations even have their own slot machines. And they have their own casinos. And you go to these casinos and you see people who least belong in there. But they have their own economies, they have tribal rules, and they have tribal federations. Which one of these three scenarios do you think is most applicable to Palestine of today? With that note, I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.